Good morning, brothers. Uh, happy Tuesday. It's 6.30 in the morning. And where are you guys? Uh, and so obviously, if we know it's with everything that's going on, uh, you guys are my audience this morning. And so we're here in the banquet hall. No one's here. No one's cooking breakfast. But praise God, we're going to get through this study. And so let's open with prayer. I'm glad you guys are able to join. Uh, this is an exciting time as we transition into the online method. I do miss the fellowship. I do miss getting together with you guys. And so hopefully this is a temporary thing because I'm looking forward for the day that we come back together and this is full. Now, for some of you who maybe join us for the first time, uh, how I do things is I, I'll be teaching our Bible study and I'll be reading for for the most part, interacting some things. And so I, uh, I wanted to let you know that if it looks like I'm just reading because uh, I'm boring, well, maybe it's so. But uh, this is how I usually do things. So let's open in prayer and we'll get into our study. Father, we thank you so much for this time. And Lord, I, I, I do miss my brothers. And I pray that you're with each and every one, Lord, uh, during this time as we're going through a, diff a different transition. And so, Jesus, may your name be glorified. Lord, as we take a portion of this scripture and study it, I pray, Lord, that your name would be glorified and honored. And Lord, I thank you for all of my brothers who are have joined us to watch this online and may be a blessing to them. And may we learn your word that we are closer to you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good seeing everybody again. And uh, and again, uh, I'm here in the banquet hall and no one's here. But anyways, let's get into our study. Uh, so this morning we're looking at Ephesians chapter 6 and we're looking at verses 1 through 4. But as a review, I wanted to take a look at, uh, to build the context so we're able to uh, transition into our study this morning. But as we've been looking in chapter 5, we notice in chapter 5, verse 1, that Paul is now telling the church of Ephesus to be imitators of God. And so as Paul has given out this instruction, later on what he's telling us to do as we start imitating God is to walk in love. Now, the word love here that Paul is using is the Greek word agape, which is the word that connotates unconditional love. You know, as we are to walk in love, we're to be imitators of God. Because later on, uh, as Paul is going on in the rest of chapter 5, uh, as he moves into the relationships that we're to have with others, he says one thing that we're to point out in chapter 5, verse 18, and he tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Well, you know, in order for us to love, to be imitators of Christ, we must be spirit-filled. There's so many things that are vying for our attention and so many things that we're to fill ourselves with. You know, we can fill ourselves with self. You know, let's do what's best for me. But a lot of times we are starting off and in, in, in not being filled with the Spirit. And so uh, as Paul is now transitioning at the end of chapter 5, to wives submit to your husbands, and husbands love your wives. The only way we can do any of that is we're imitators of Christ, that we walk in love, and most of all, being filled with the Spirit. So if you remember with me that uh, Paul is exhorting the church of Ephesus, again, to be imitators of God, where we get the Greek word mimic, uh, we're to mimic God, and in his love, which is agape love, which is unconditional, which has no conditions at all. And then in chapter 5, verse 15, Paul's instructing us to walk circumspectly. We're to walk carefully. It's if we're walking through a minefield and we're to walk carefully and strategically through this minefield so we don't step on mines. Or if for any of us who have barns or a farm that we're to walk through the fields without stepping on manure or anything like that. And Paul is telling us that we're to walk circumspectly as well because the enemy has set up pitfalls for us to fall into. And, you know, we use this word in the Christian circles, walk. You know, when we use the word walk, uh, it's, it's often, again, heard in Christian circles. It's this Christianese that we can speak among believers. But for somebody who is not within the Christian circles and this conversations of Christianese, when we hear the word walk, or it's, we see it illustrated in the Bible, it's a figure of speech of our condition, of our, our, our conduct of life. We can also often hear, hey, brother, how's your walk? Or, hey, have you been walking close to the Lord? 
In other words, it's, it's actually used to uh, how we conduct our lives in the Lord. And our walks can walk according to uh, uh, the flesh that Paul points out here. Or we can walk circumspectly, or we can walk in love, or Paul tells us in chapter 4 to walk worthy of our calling. And so we see this, uh, this word thrown around uh, of walking, and now Paul tells us that we're to walk circumspectly in chapter 5, verse 15. We're to walk carefully as brothers and in men of God. There's so many things that are fighting for our attention. You know, we just look in the media all around us. There's fear. There's uh, all kinds of different things that that we can that can become pitfalls in our life, and we're to conduct our lives as walking carefully. And so, as we have now looked at the end of chapter five in our previous weeks, we see that Paul has given an instruction to the wives: wives are to submit to your husbands, as it says in chapter five, verse twenty-two. But it says, wives, submit to your own husbands. But husbands, in order for our wives to submit to us, are we modeling the love of Christ to her? Because later on in chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as just as Christ has also loved the church and has given himself for her. You know, this love, again, that Paul's speaking of here is the highest form of love that we can ever show one another. It's the love that Jesus showed us when he died on the cross for our sins. It's the love that we see in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Husbands, are we loving our wives as we've loved the church? You know, so many times we can throw the, the verse in chapter 5, verse 22, wives, you must submit to your own husbands, and we can drop the mic and walk away, right? But sometimes what we feel to, fail to see as men is that we're to love our wives as Christ has loved the church. No conditions. Imagine if we started putting conditions in our wife's, in our, in our loves for our wife. Well, you know, she does this and so I can't love her or she does that and, and so I can't love her. What if the, 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 the shoes were switched and Jesus was to put conditions on our relationship with you and I? Well, you know, uh, I'll love you, John, when you can do this or I'll love you, John, when you can do that. Praise God that he has not put conditions on us. And as men, just as Jesus has loved the church, we also are to love our wives. And now what Paul now does is transitions from, from wives, instruction to the wives, to instruction to, the, to the, the husbands. And now Paul's transitioning here in chapter 6 to children. And so let's read verses 1 through 4 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and, may, and you may live long on earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and ad admonition of the Lord. So Paul now addresses the children. And, and he uses the word here, child, which in the original language, it's an interesting word. Uh, according to one's commentator, it still speaks of those children who at, who are still living at home, but they're yet they're old enough to hear the instruction from their parents and to deliberate whether they should obey or, or go their own way. You know, we see a perfect example of this in Luke chapter 15, when Jesus is speaking of the prodigal son. It says a certain man had two sons. So we see that these two sons were still in the household of this man. And this it's interesting that uh, these can refer to as children who may have not been married yet or children who are re receiving instruction and cor corrections from their fathers, which can age anywhere from elementary age up to their early 20s. But right away, Paul is telling the children to obey. And so we see that Paul is addressing the children directly, and he's not using their parents to pass along this instruction. This tells us that in a time when community would come together, they would get together and worship. They would hear the word of God. They would receive teaching and everyone here would be present. And Paul is now addressing the children. What's interesting here is that Paul uses the word obey rather than the word submit that he had instructed the wives to do to their own husbands. It's an interesting word obey here 
that uh, again is referencing to the wife. But the word obey here in the original language would mean compliance or heeding to instruction, paying close attention and, and following and closely examined to follow through of instructions. It carries a stronger meaning than submit. It helps understand that the unquestioning compliance that is expected from their children towards their parents. You know, the Old Testament warns the danger of having a stubborn and rebellious child, ones who don't obey their parents when disciplined. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 20 says. It says, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when then have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take a hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of the city. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones so that you shall put away the evil from among you and all Israel shall fear and hear. And again, in first Samuel chapter three, verse 13, it says in regards to Eli and his two sons, it says his sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. See, this instruction here that uh, goes a little further than obedience because Paul instructs here in verse one, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. So we see that Paul is pointing out to this obedience goes above and beyond just obeying parents. He's referencing the respect and love given to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This goes beyond the parental cliche is because I told you so. You need to obey me because I told you so. And it's also part of the exhortation that Paul gives later on in verse 10 as be strong in the Lord. You know, if we want to be imitators of God and we want to walk in love, if we're to be filled with his spirit and walk circumspectly, then us as children, we're to be obedient to our parents and please the Lord in all things. And in verse 2, Paul, that we see that gives a second admonition. He says, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. You know, Paul's telling us here, honor your parents. So first, Paul's talking about children, obey your parents. And now Paul's giving a second admonition of honoring your parents. Taken from the fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments, this is unique in that it has a promise that's connected with it. We see that Jesus reiterates the importance of this commandment when he sharply criticizes the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15, verses 3 through 6. And this is what it says. And he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received for me is a gift to God. Then he, did, then he not need not to honor his mother or father. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. You know, anybody can go through the action of honoring our parents. But we know it's the attitude of our heart that that really over that speaks more than the action itself. It makes all the difference of the world. You know, uh, you know. Looking to my kids, we see that there's different motives for obedience. Uh, one is fear. If I were to say to my kids, "Get upstairs right now," boom, they're gone. I would see dust kicking up because they went up the stairs so quickly. But do you think that they did this in obedience because they loved me? Are you kidding? They obeyed me because they were feared of getting the chancla or the wooden spoon. They were scared of getting spanked, so they went up. The second way of obeying is when you want something. You know, my daughter has learned that when she has done something, uh, something that I have been asking her to do, or my wife and I have been asking her to do, uh, she's learned that she will do what she's been asked to do, but later on, 
in return, she'll ask for a favor. For example, uh, I'll say, hey, Annabelle, you, you, cleaned your, you cleaned up your room. Yes, Daddy, I thought I would just do that because it's what you wanted me to do. And I was like, oh, God, what, a, what an awesome young princess you are. But about 10 minutes later, she would come and she would ask me for something. Because she figured that if she cleaned her room, that she would be able to ask for certain things. Wait a minute. It, why is she obeying me? Because she loves me? Well, I'm sure she does. No, because there's something she wants. And sometimes our obedience can follow the same suit. This is why she did what she did. I tried to tell her I was, wasn't born yesterday. I tried the same things with my dad. I would cut the grass or I'd paint and I'd do something. I was like, okay, dad, uh, can I get 20 bucks from you? And, uh, you know, and so I did the same thing with my dad. But, you know, the real way to obey is out of love and respect and out of honor. When Paul uses the word honor here in verse 2, it, it speaks of being to esteem and to value, to hold in the highest regard and respect, treat us precious and to revere. Now, if we think that these commandments aren't important, then we have another thing coming because in the Old Testament, it says in Exodus 21, verse 15, he who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death. You know, these are important to God. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 17, he says, he who curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. And so, you know, one of the things I want to share with you is that we, we take this word honor and we take this word obey. And, and because we live in a society that's so permissive, we've pulled away so far from God that we think that God's design is, is based on anything we want to do with our parents. You know, if we're going to walk in circumspectly and, and be imitators of God and, and to uh, walk in love, if we're going to be spirit-filled, we're not only going to obey what the Word tells us, but we're going to have an attitude behind that obedience that brings honor to our parents. You know, uh, to honor our parents encompasses not only obeying them when we are young, but it, it has this built-in provision, not even a provision, but it has this thing built into it that when they're old, we'd be able to provide for them. You see, if we start honoring our parents now, you will honor them when they're old. If you don't love and respect them now, you're not going to love and respect them when they're old and had need of you. You know, when we think of our parents, they, we think of the thousands of dollars that they spent on us. And there will come a day when we, they're unable to do what they used to do. And this is when honor really comes in because uh, it comes to the surface. This is where honor truly comes to fruition. You're not to only honor your parents when we are young, but to provide for them when they're old. And this is what honor is all about. You know, as some of you guys know my a little bit of my background, I, I brought a lot of dishonor to my parents. And uh, as they got older, I, I was able to see as they began to get older and, and their health was depleting, I, I look back at when the times that I, I brought dishonor to my parents and, and it's sometimes still hard for me to live with because of the dishonor that I brought to them, the shame. And, and, you know, they did so well raising me up and, and leading me in the ways of the Lord and providing a loving and good family, godly family. My parents were godly, but it was because of my disobedience. I didn't bring honor to them. You know, I don't share this too many times, but I'm able to share this now because I was able to ask my dad for forgiveness. So I'm able to speak through this without getting emotional. You know, talking about dishonoring my parents, there was a time when uh, I had been using and, and, uh, and you know, I, I became really rebellious and I had a lot of anger and hatred in my heart. And I remember one, uh, one evening I, I had come home and uh, I had been upset. And, and uh, I remember my dad uh, saying something to me and I remember I got up <laughs> And uh, I pushed him. I pushed him to the floor. <sighs> the look in his face that he had. His own son doing something like this to him. And 
you know, that, that, I don't want to say haunted me, that thought burned into my mind and it burned into my heart for many years. And before he passed away, I was, this was one of the things that I was able to bring to him and say, Dad, will you please forgive me for this? That was actually years before he passed away. And looking back, now that I have lost both parents, I, I, I wish I could have honored them a lot more. I wish that I was able to provide for them as they provided for me when I was younger. Even though we did have our time of, of my wife and I being able to help them, I still hang on to those things where I feel, man, I just wish I would have had a little bit more time to bring more honor and respect to them. And this is what Paul is telling us. He's telling us that we're to honor our fathers and our mothers, our parents. It's, it's not just an act, but it's an attitude that's carried out. And for those who are fortunate enough to still have your parents, honor them, love them, because think of the things that they've done for you. And not only that, it goes beyond that because it's an instruction that Paul's given us here, that all of us are child, of, of, as children were to bring love and honor to our parents. And so, you know, there was a time where I brought dishonor to my parents and, and uh, it, it still bothers me this day. It's still hard for me to think about, oh, I wish I could go back. But one day I know I'll see them again in heaven and I'll be able to uh, love them and hold them. And, uh, and so, again, Paul's telling us here that uh, in, chapter, in verse 2, that we're to honor them. That this is uh, a first commandment that has a promise. This command is unique because we see that there's a promise attached. So what is this promise? Well, let's look at verse 3 that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So we see that we're to honor our, our parents, we're to honor our mother and father, which is the first commandment with promise. Even though it's the fifth commandment of the 10 commandments, this is the first commandment that comes with the promise. And what is that promise? Well, we see in verse three, that it may be well with you, that, we may, uh, that you may live long life on earth. So we see here that there's a twofold promise that this scripture associates with obedience to our parents, blessings and a long life. You know, this part here where it says uh, that you may, that it may be well with you comes from Deuteronomy chapter five, verse 16, where it says, honor your mother, your father and your mother as the Lord has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you and in the land which your God is given you. These promises are motivating but it's important not to over-spiritualize the promises and see here as it's referencing to eternal life. Some people think, well, this promise is connected to eternal life. This is not what Paul's saying here. Because if it was connected to eternal life, it would not mention uh, living long on earth. And so these promises are motivating. Paul would not have included a long life on earth it was, if it was talking in eternity. We know that eternity comes through our faith and obedience in Jesus Christ. And so, you know, I, I often hear this sometimes. You know, I, I'm good to my parents, uh, so I know the Lord's gonna bless me with this thing or that thing. You know, I, I hear these, these things going around like that, but that attitude is not bringing honor to the Lord. And this promise is not re re uh, referencing material things. It's, uh, it's, it's not to be mixed up with, I'm gonna be prosper, I'm gonna be prosperous because I'm, I'm good to my parents. No, we're good. We're to be good to our parents because God has instructed us to. We're to bring honor to them. And we know that just as uh, everybody has a different relationship with their parents, we know that this can be applied to every, every person that is a believer, to every child who's a believer. Uh, we know that God's promises uh, when we're good to our parents is that we're in his will. And so there is no prosperity gospel message to being, uh, obeying or honoring your parents. It's an instruction from the Lord. And when we're instructing and doing what the Lord has called us to do, then we'll have that long life. Does it mean that it'll be full of money, full of cars, full of... No, but it means that we're in the middle of God's will and that we believe that uh, God's providence will watch over all of us who are children that bring uh, obedience to our parents if he regards the falling sparrow in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, will he be not mindful of the obedient child? 
If he numbers the hairs of the head in Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, which obviously doesn't work for me, would he not regard the little boy or the son or the daughter that honors him by obeying a mother and a father? And see, men, we have this opportunity now to continue to, uh, as we see here, not only does Paul, the word of God instruct us to be good to our wives and for wives to, to honor and respect your husbands, but as men, we have an opportunity for those, again, who still have your parents, love them. Uh, bring honor to the Lord through your relationship with them. And we will see that in God, in all his providence, in all his love, will surround our life who are obedient to our mothers and our fathers. And in verse 4, it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, Paul is now switching his, uh, his he's transitioning now from addressing children now to fathers. And as men who are fathers, we can play, uh, pay close attention to what he's telling us. He tells us here, Paul warns them not to treat their children in such a way that they'll become angry and bitter. This is why he says, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and in the, I'm sorry, and in the admonition of the Lord. So we see that this instruction right off the bat, it says, and you fathers. Some believe that Paul is using a generic term that can include both mother and father. But when you look at this word, and you fathers, the word fathers in the original language, we get the word pateris, where we get the word paternal, which speaks of being a father. And so all of us men this morning who are here, who are fathers, this is for you and I. You know, in the Jewish culture, as well as in the Roman culture, the father was ultimately responsible for the education and discipline of their children. This passage teaches us as fathers that we need to exercise a sensitivity and care in how we're to interact with our children, and especially in how they're disciplined. We who are fathers should carefully weigh the potential impact of our words and actions before we respond to our, our children. I've made the mistake, I, I've made the horrible mistake of disciplining my children while upset. You know, and afterwards I would feel so horrible. Or I'd said things to them that I wish I wouldn't have said. Things that I wish I can take back. And this passage here where it tells us to, as fathers, don't provoke your children. This passage rules out the reactionary flare-ups that we can have in response. The over-harsh words that we can say the insults, the sarcasm, the demeaning comments, the inappropriate teasing, the unreasonable demands, and anything else that can be perceived as negative or that will cause hurt. One of the most difficult things that I've seen with even my daughter and my son when I've said things in overreaction is seeing their little, their little shoulders drop as they've been hurt by my words. And we see this a lot. I, I see it a lot. I see it in counseling when counseling couples are bringing their children in the things that people would say that were hurtful or, or that, would, that would bring demeaning to the child. I would see their shoulders drop as their hearts have been hurt. And this is one of the most difficult things that I have seen in my own life that I have provoked my children. And it's hard to see and, and I feel so horrible afterwards. You know, the word used here, provoke, speaks of causing anger and hurt to, ir to irritate or frustrate severely. You know, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, uh, Paul instructs, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So fathers, are our words, our instruction to our children, are they edifying or are they tearing down? Are we instructing them in the ways of the Lord? Are we pouring our hearts into them by giving them the word of God? Because if we're not influencing their lives and training them in the ways of the Lord, something else is. And in a few moments, we'll take a look at this. But here in verse four, it continues to say, 
uh, but bring them up in the training and in the admonition of the Lord. Again, fathers, we have the ultimate responsibility of raising our children in such a way that they'll be trained and developed and having a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, to love him and to build their faith centered on the Lord. And when Paul mentions here to bring them up, he's also saying to raise them in instruction, raise them in instruction of the Lord. This has the same connotation in chapter five, verse 29, when Paul points out that we're not to hate our own flesh, but we're to nourish and cherish it as Jesus does the church. It has the same idea of nurturing and cherishing as it tells us here to raise our children up in the instruction of the Lord. Men, raising our children is to be done in such a way where there's tenderness and nourishing care and bring them to a place of maturity in the Lord. This speaks of the process of child rearing all the way up to adulthood. And Paul lays on his shoulders as he does to the fathers of the church of Ephesus, the responsibility of raising our children in such a way that not only are they respectful to people, but to train them and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. Men, fathers, are we doing that? Are we raising our children in the ways of the Lord? Some of us may have children that are grown and out of the house. Are we still reflecting the love of Christ to them? Men, again, and I've said this in our previous studies, we may be the only gospel that people read. We may be the only Jesus that people see. We may be the only Bible that people read, especially our children. What message are we giving them? Are we nurturing them and cherishing them and leading them in the ways of the Lord? Or have we allowed Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook and all these things take over their minds? You know, we can come so busy. All of us have failed in this area. I've failed in this area. Where we quick to, we're, we're quick to hand our kids cell phones or iPads to keep them busy when they're young or we ourselves have neglected to spend time with our kids because of our hectic and busy schedules. Paul instructs us fathers here to bring up our children in the training and in admonition of the Lord. But yet we've allowed YouTube, we've allowed Snapchat, we've allowed roadblocks to raise our kids. We've allowed Facebook and Instagram, the very thing this message is gonna go out on to, to take over our children's mind. We have handed our children over to the ways of the world. And we have to be careful because we can lose our children to these things, to lose our children to the ways of the world. The word ad admonition here that is at the end of verse four, it says, bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. It's used here as reference to counsel, to encourage, to correct, to, to show them proper behavior. And doing these things requires spending time with our children. That's all our babies want, is, been, is to spend time with them. But we get so busy. You know, as I close, I, I wanna share a story uh, that I came across and and I was convicted by this uh, because I can come home from work and I can come home from the, a busy day and I can get so wrapped up in, in processing the things of the whole day that, that I've unmindfully haven't spent time with my children. And you know, there was a famous song that came out in, I think it came out in the seventies called Cat in the Cradle, where uh, if you haven't heard that song, listen to the lyrics because it's powerful. Uh, and it speaks of, along the lines of this story uh, but this story really hit home for me because as Paul is instructing children to obey your parents, we have a greater responsibility as fathers to raise our children in the ways of the Lord, to encourage them, to admonish them, to instruct them, to love them. And Paul's telling us here that we are to not provoke our children, but we're to bring them in the ways of the Lord and so as we're men of God, men of God's word, men of the spirit, we must love our children. And if you, for those who have young babies, love on them, spend time with them. Uh, sometimes they drive me nuts, my kids, but they need us. 
They need us fathers. And for all of us sons who are still have our parents, honor our parents, because when we honor them, we bring glory to the Lord. But listen to this story. A man came home from work late, tired and irritated, to five his, find his five-year-old son waiting for him at the door. The son says, Daddy, may I ask you a question? And the dad says, yeah, sure. What is it? Replied the father. Well, Daddy, how much do you make an hour? The father replies, that's none of your business, son. Why would you ask such a thing? The boy says, Daddy, I just want to know. Please tell me, how much do you make an hour? And the father responds, if you must know, I make $50 an hour. Oh, the little boy replied with his head down. He then says, Daddy, may I borrow $25? The father was furious. If the only reason you ask me that is so you can borrow some money to buy a silly toy or some other nonsense, then march yourself straight into that bedroom and go to bed and think about why you're being so selfish. I don't work hard every day for such childish frivolities. The little boy put his head down and went quietly to his bedroom and shut the door. The man sat down and started to get even more angry as he thought about his son's questions. How dare him ask me questions to get some money from me? After about an hour or so, the man calmed down and he started to think, well, maybe there's something he really needed to buy with that $25 and really didn't doesn't ask for many, money so often. So the father went to the door of the little boy and, and he knocked on it. And he opened the door and he says, son, are you asleep? And the boy says, no, daddy, I'm awake. And the dad says, I've been thinking hard about this and maybe I was a little too harsh on you earlier, said, said the father. You know, it's been a long day and, and I took out my aggravation on you. So here's the $25 you asked for. And the little boy sat up straight up smiling. Oh, thank you, daddy. Thank you so much. And then reaching under his pillow, he pulled out some crumpled up bills. The man saw the boy already had money and started to get angry again. But the little boy slowly began to count out his money and he looked up to his father. Why do you want more money if you already have some? The father grumbled. He said, the little boy said, because I didn't have enough, daddy, but now I do. Daddy, I have $50 now. Can I buy an hour of your time? Please come home early tomorrow. I'd love to have dinner with you. The father was crushed. And he put his arms around the little son and he, and he begged for his forgiveness. Men, let us be faithful in raising our children. And if our children are already grown, let's be faithful to show them the love of Jesus Christ because we only have one shot at this. And we have the privilege and the honor to obey our parents for those who still have our, our parents. And for those of us who still have children, love on them, spend time with them, show them the love of Christ because we want to be men of God's word. And as Paul has now shared of, to us about wives submitting to our own husbands and, and husbands loving our wives. And today we looked at, this morning we looked at children obeying our parents. But even more than that, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but to raise them in the admonition and training of the Lord. Give our kids Jesus, because we're living in a world and in a society today where it's all chaotic and hectic. And the thing that the enemy is going to fight for is the mind and heart of our children. Let's be faithful to stay strong be in the word, pray with our kids and, and love our children. And when we do so, we bring glory and honor to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. And Lord, I thank you for this morning as we're studying your word. I pray, Lord, that we would be continued, that we'd be men of God, that would spend time with our children, that we would obey our parents, that we'd bring honor to them, that we would love our wives, that are, and, and, and wives, maybe some wives are watching that, that we would love our husbands and respect them. And Lord, as you're given us the model of the family, we 
could understand why our families are so dysfunctional today is because we have stepped away from your word. Let us be men of God, men of your word, and may we always look to you for everything, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Men, I love you. I miss you guys, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. God bless you.